everyone. Uh, it's about a minute after. We'll go ahead and get started. Um, today, uh, it's a previously aired um, video or webinar that we've had about buried ducks. Uh, it's still relevant today, even though the video in the, our on our channel actually states that it's for 2018. That's when it actually rolled out into the IECC. Uh, it, it is still relevant today, so it's being recorded today. You can find it on our YouTube channel. Uh, it can be found um, by searching SPEAR on the YouTube channel uh, or go to our website under eepartnerships.org. And under our news section, you'll find the resource page. And under the resource page, you'll see a link to our channel. Uh, within about 72 hours of the presentation, you'll receive a course evaluation email from Kathy Lawrence. Uh, please complete that survey and send it back to her to receive your course completion certificate that will contain the course ID number that you'll need to use when reporting your CEUs to ICC. Uh, lastly, the chat feature is open. Uh, please use that to report any technical difficulties you may be experiencing with the presentation. Uh, and the Q&A feature is also open. Please use that to post any questions you might have, and I'll do my best to answer them at the end of the presentation. So today's presenter is Neil Freeberg. At that time, he was just about two years ago, almost three years ago, he was with Owens Corning. Uh, he does a great job of explaining in detail when it's considered to be buried ducks and what techniques can be used uh, based on the climate zone. So it's not just a one size fit all for buried ducks. As the energy code stringencies increase, builders have, have been addressing changes uh, to the new codes, and they're also looking to not increase building costs, but increase their chances of complying with the ever-changing code requirements. Uh, Third-party verifiers do a great job of running updated energy analysis as new code cycles are published. Uh, using software, they compare the current builds to new code changes and adjust the envelopes, the mechanics, the ductworks to show compliance. So having a code-approved allowance such as buried ducts can help builders offset the new energy requirements while also keeping their building costs down. So without further discussion, we'll go ahead and get into it. Give me just one second to load up the video.
because uh, most of you guys actually probably don't care about the cost much more. You guys actually much more care about the bare, you know, the concept, code language, uh, fuel data, and then how do they, how, how do you install them? That matters because inspecting them is important. All right, so buried ducts, what are they, right? So it is what it is. It's a duct and it's buried. Hold on one second. Sorry, there's uh, seemed to be an issue with the sound. Uh, it's working on my end. I'm not sure why others can't hear it. Hold on one second. Uh, okay, I've changed a few settings. I'm going to just go ahead and push play and start the by insulation. This one just happens to be an image that was taken from uh, Hurl, uh, Home Innovation Research Labs. And what they did was they, they have a combination of in, uh, uh, square and then flex duct on the, on the registers. So one thing that we want to do as a goal of this is to get it as low as fast as possible. So if you look at this picture, it shows the main trunk line going over the joists and then the, the actual trunk line, the, the reg, you know, the, the trunk line that goes to the register on the ceiling floor, the lower, the better. Um, one of the other things that we talk about is what is the R value of the duct? Now I, I will, I will add a caveat to this. Um, so one of the things is that we have to separate it by climate zone. Why? Because climates aren't the same everywhere, right? If you look at the map, R8 is a ginormous portion of the United States. And the R13 duct area happens to be about 50 to 70% of all construction in the United States. So you can see the huge difference. Um, in climate zone 1A, 2A, and 3A, we are required to put an R13 duct. Now, uh, this is my caveat. In the field, we've found out, and in, in a couple of things that I've done, we found out that R13, one, doesn't exist, so you have to actually fabricate it yourself. Um, but two, it's actually, it's, 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 um, it's a lot more work than the necessary because we believe an R8 duct will work. And that's what the, that's what I'm going to be doing with, uh, uh NREL and, uh, Building Science Corp in, uh, the Galveston area is testing if, uh, we can do an R8 duct in an, in an attic. Um, but the, you know, the effective R value of it in R, 403.3.6. Uh, um, one of the things that we get to do is actually uh, uh, set set standards to what needs to happen. So you you have the duct in a very specific location. It's surrounded by insulation greater than R30, and it has to be top with a minimum of, of a 3.5 uh, inch of insulation uh, below. And uh, so deeply buried ducts uh, end up taking the effective uh, R value of a R25, if that makes any sense to anybody. So basically um, you have an R25 around the duct and then the duct itself. And that's on your, on the, so if I'm submitting my rim rate, if, I, if I'm doing an input for my performance report for permit, you're saying that I can list R25 as my flex duct insulated value? Yes, correct. Yeah. Yep. Because effectively that's what you have, right? You, you have such a deeply buried duct that the insulation around it is keeping it almost in condition space. And uh, we have data to show what we're talking about. Thank you for the question. Um, so the condition space criteria, right? So for energy modeling, right? Because technically these ducts are not in condition space at all. So the buried duct allows us to say, you know, hey, the unit should be in condition space. There is code language that allows the unit not to be in, not to be in the like a closet. It could be in the attic. But 1.5 CFM per thousand square foot of uh, leakage to the outside. That is important because that basically is equivalent to um, that reduces that makes a, a uh, that makes the effective uh, 
leakage so minimal that it's acting as if it is in conditioned space. Um, and then the benefit of the uh, R value is that you get to use the R, you know, you, you get to reduce the R value over it as long as you deeply bury it, right? So that, you, you know, if let's say for the picture under three, it's a um, R38. Well, that, it's not an R38 directly over it. The top uh, to the ceiling would be continuous in R38. So the insulation underneath, insulation on top account to the R38. And of course that, you know, I, I spoke about the air handler being in the envelope. Um, while, you know, in, on paper, that's, that's great. I know in practice, it's almost impossible. I've, I've worked on, you know, I worked with a builder trying to build, you know, what we call we ended up calling a doghouse in the attic um, just to, just to in, uh, encapsulate the unit. And it's just a difficult process. So if, if it's not designed to be in the attic, I mean, if, it's, if, it's, if the unit's not designed to be actually in the condition space, there is a way to do it in the attic now. Um, but I don't, I don't know if the code language has been approved yet. So I'll probably have to get back to you on that. For the air handler? Yes. Now, the, my understanding of, well, now granted, you, you, my understanding is that, now are you asking, so my understanding and the way I read it is, if the air handler is in the attic, you can still, that's when you can say that the, then you can use R25 for your duct, but if your air handler is in conditioned space and you're less than that, the 1.5 CFM, then you can say the entire, the ducts and the air handler in conditioned space. I, I thought you couldn't space. say that the whole thing was in conditioned space. If I, just... I think I think I think you're right, and you know that's a caveat I am not familiar with. Um, okay. Because I I've been implementing it. I haven't been you know sitting at a desk talking about it anymore. You know what I mean? Right. Yes. All right. Yeah. So you're making it work in the field. You're not worrying about coat. Yeah. 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 Gotcha. So so you're probably absolutely right. And okay. and I apologize for not being a hundred percent up to date on that situation. But no I worries. Right. I think I I think this is considered condition space, but yeah. otherwise you get to you get to use the effective R the effective R value of twenty five for the other condition. Yeah, yeah. I think that's but right. But it is allowed, and, right? There's two options, is what I'm trying to say. Okay, sounds good. Right. So buried ducts is what the bare minimum of allows you. Um, so can you guys see my mouse? I don't know. Yes, we can. We can. Okay, we perfect. can see it moving. Perfect. So, um, the nice thing about the buried ducts, right? So here, you know, let's say you have an R38, and here you don't. Um, that's typically not considered acceptable. Um, what we what we end up having to do is uh, uh, having to mound it over, and and you'll see pictures later where we mound over the little trunk lines uh, to to maintain a somewhat continuous you know, R value, but then there's the deeply buried where you have it so low that this is where you get that effective R value, right? So it, it acts as if, and mind you, it doesn't have to be this where there's like a chase. It could be like this, but the insulation level above it has to be much higher. Does that make sense? Absolutely. Okay. And then- and that's, how, and that's how I read it as well. You, you have to have the full, uh, six inches on top, so it has to be mounted. Yep, correct. And then, so we, you know, we we've uh, we're pro this is what we're doing with bar uh, deeply buried ducts um, because of costs. Is uh, where we're building. Uh, while it's not approved yet, and I, I think we went, uh, I think we were working with Joe Stebrick on on this. Um, what we're talking about is basically building a uh, dam on both the right and left side of it, and then making that making the duct itself be in a deeply buried situation while the other house, well, the other, other portions of the house that don't have ducts, don't have any issues can be, you know, the, the R38, R49, depending on what, um, what you want to do. Sorry, my phone is uh, going ham for whatever reason. You're a busy man. Okay. So this is the fun part, right? Is um, buried ducts effective R value table. Uh, this is uh, this is what we end up going to, right? So if you have a four inch and you have an R13 attic insulation 
it, it, it basically tells you what, what needs to be blown um, uh, over the duct, right? So if you need an R30, you have, an R, you have a four inch, then you need an R13 over that to make it an R30. Um, the reason why is because we're allowed to calculate an R. So in, let's say this was climate zone. Um, this was a climate zone that needed. Um, and this is in California, though. This I noticed this is coming from the ACM reference manual in California. This wouldn't be exactly how you would do it in Texas, but it does work that way in California. I, I, I feel the jab. Skip, you know, skip. Got it. No, no, no worries. Um, <laughs> but, but no, that's good. That's good information, though, because that, that, that gives the math, you know. Okay, this is, I mean, just because a lot of times as a code, I know me as a code inspector, you know, back, back in the, before I got clean and quit riding red tags and, and getting fell off the wagon and all that good stuff. A lot of times you see things in the field and just being able to have that background math or that background knowledge of how that might work. I mean, I think that's beneficial. So I, I don't, California yeah. is some crazy in some areas, but they do some good things in others. So yeah, okay. yeah. But I mean, this, the, the nice thing of this table is while yes, they use in California, it's still a good reference manual everywhere else. Cause this is, I use this table to, to justify, you know, how much R value goes. Cause you always get that question. Well, I have a, I have a 20 inch duct. Uh, what's my R value? And it's not yeah. on the table, but if I have a 12 inch duct, I need this R value, how much do I need to go over, right? So it's, it's always a really good reference. Yeah, absolutely. Um, yeah, so, and, and then California criteria, sorry, this is, this is our generic um, overall inflation, right? Uh, so the, the one thing about this is when they first came out with this, um, and the reason why climate zone 1A, 2A, and 3A are uh, what they are with an R13 was because they took um, an R6 duct and they sprayed it with about an inch of closed cell on there and that was roughly an R13 and so that's where that number came from. There's not a manufacturer to date that has an R13 duct. Um, so what we do in the field is we have to pull an R8 duct through an R6 duct. I have a chart for that, it's not on here, um, but once again I actually we, we, we've done studies to show that it's uh, that's a little bit overkill. Um, all right, so infield data. Now, now, this is where it matters. Um, so a majority of the stuff that came from Hurl uh, was done in, in a Lady Smith Island uh, test home. Uh, and this was one that we worked with. Um, I forget the builder. I apologize. That uh, someone else instrumented and we just basically observed, right? So they, they required an RA. They had 49 uh, loose fill, they, we measured temp and humidity, uh, almost a year's worth of data. <clears throat> and so you can see here that while around the R, around the duct itself, RH is, um, changes rapidly, especially in, in an area that climate changes rapidly, because uh, attics are constantly changing. They're not constantly at 120, you know, they warm up throughout the day and they cool throughout the night. And so because of that, it affects the R value, uh, the, the relative humidity in that space. Um, so the one thing that we're doing is currently these blue stars uh, are the test homes that I have currently censored and collecting data on for buried ducts itself. Um, the red ones are proposed uh, locations. Uh, the one in Galveston is gonna be five homes. Uh, we're looking at doing one in the Panhandle, doing one in South Florida and doing one um, out there by Daytona Beach. Uh, all this to understand different roofing and how it affects the buried duct situation. Because um, one thing that we did learn in, in, in modeling um, is that a radiant barrier actually can in, uh, increase the, the chance for condensation on ducts. Uh, so we actually want a hotter attic than what we would typically want. And I know, I, I know people are looking at this and going, that's insane because it's totally opposite of everything that we've done in Texas because you can't almost find a, a builder that doesn't have radiant barrier. Well, but the fact warm that the air. temperature, yeah, yeah, well, I mean, the fact warm that the air temperature- Warm air water though, right? I, I remember I was giving a class in Beaumont and uh, their solution for their ducks sweating and dripping was to plug up all of their ventilation so like oh yeah man now my attic gets up to like 180 but it'll hold all that moisture i don't get condensation anymore and i was th and i'm thinking to myself there's a uh, better option 
but anyway, go ahead. Sorry. Yeah, yeah, but 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 you're right. I mean, that that's basically the situation is we're increasing increasing the temperature, reducing relative humidity, and um, but but we know that that is not a a good option for everywhere, right? Uh, especially when you know builders have competitors that, that use radiant barrier, upsell radiant barrier, and say your attic is going to be cooler to store more things. And we we as you know, as as uh, as I work with builders, I realize how much they actually hate the fact that people put storage stuff in attics. Um, but yes, so they they utilize that for storage, and this is one of the items that we can't have uh, currently in our modeling, but we want, we want life, you know, we want real life proof where we test different attics. We're going to, we're going to, we're going to do um, tile roofs. We're going to do, you know, asphalt roofs and in a year or two, but we'll probably be testing, you know, reflective light roofing. So um, just to see how it works, even though I don't know a single builder who actually utilizes that system. I, this um, it's crazy. I mean, black architectural shingles and our equipment that makes cold air in our 150 degree attic. That's a great idea too for Texas. Uh, real quick, Neil, sorry to interrupt. I forgot on the housekeeping side. Um, we have 108 people on the webinar, so I can't unmute folks for questions, but there is a chat bar and a Q&A bar. If you will just type in your questions on the chat or the q and I'll answer them the best I can while Neil's giving his presentation. Those that I can't answer, we'll save for Neil at the end. Sorry about that, go ahead. Yeah, yeah, no, no problem. All right, so uh, Climate Zone 4B uh, doesn't matter to us. This was the Lady Smith stuff. This is the one that we, we uh, monitored and we're testing and we found no condensation to date. Uh, we actually have pulled our sensors from that, uh, from that but um, there hasn't been much of a concern. Um, I'm, yeah, okay, and then climate zone 2A, and this happens, happens to be in, um, you know, some of you Texas people will, will you know, enjoy it, but um, so in Clifton, Texas, uh, basically west of Waco, uh, we, we monitored a house, we did buried ducks there, uh, it was an R13, and we found, I think out of, because we're actually still monitoring that to this day, but this is typically the season where we see the transition where from hot to cold, from you know cold to hot, back to. Um, so we we want to you know during this process, we have not seen a uh, any major dripping, any major issues in that, and this is once again this is a, this is a house without radiant barrier. It's an R13 uh, supply trunk, and um, you know one of the benefits of actually doing buried ducts is the the cooling capacity is actually decreased. Um, and let, let me explain myself. Um, when people design ducts in Texas, they have to design ducts that go from, like uh, Jason said, uh, the hottest part of the house, right? So we have to, uh, they have to oversize uh, HVAC units to cool the added heat that comes in through that duct. So as you're pushing air through there, all that heat is coming in through the duct and you have to increase your, your tonnage to increase cooling capacity. But with buried ducts, we would actually require, so this builder wanted to put a, uh, a four and a half ton unit in a home and we fought back and forth and we settled on the three ton unit, even though I believe a two and a half ton unit would have done a better job um, because of uh, short cycling, right? And the reason why I say that is because I'll show you in a different slide. The difference uh, from supply to a, a 39 foot run where it goes to the duct was um, 1.4 degree difference. Um, so you're basically getting, you know, 55 degree uh, temperature on the coil, you're getting 56 into a room. And what happens is, is you hyper cool that room causing short cycle. Um, so here, here's a combination of some of the areas that we were looking at. This, uh, this happens to be another builder in um, uh, just outside Georgetown. Um, sorry, not Georgetown, um, Round Rock. So it's just outside Round Rock. Um, so by, by Austin area. Uh, checking, you know, temperature relative humidity. As you can see, we have um, relative humidity in, in, in very particular areas, right? So the top is, is very high. 
but as you get uh, lower, you can see that the relative humidity decreases in the insulation itself because the temperature also changes. And then on the right hand side where we have, uh, you know, where you, it is going to become inevitable where you have some sort of duct on top of a duct situation. Uh, we wanted to see how compression works and how all those items work. And you can see that while there are times where it gets high up there, which happens to be at the top, the lower one that is actually carrying, so this is a return over supply. So the return air is warmer and the, the cooler air is the bottom. You can see that the blue is actually what's being pushed through on what's, you know, that, that's, that's a duct that's carrying all that cool, cool air. And that relative humidity is staying, rel, you know, relatively in the you know, 50s to 70s. So never, never allowing it to actually condense. All right, so this is, this is what I was talking about. So this is the longest duct run. This was uh, where I effectively said, look, here's the attic temperature, right? So here we have days of 140, uh, come down to 75 in the evenings, come back up. And you can see where the system is on and off, right? These little peaks are on and off cycles where it goes on, they decrease, it turns off, it increases. Someone leaves the house, it shoots up high. It, it, the system, you know, I'm reading temperatures. And as you can see here, the blue, uh, the blue line is the supplier and that uh, orange, uh, the darker brown is much, in a much more constant is uh, the longest duct run. So you can see that on average, they're, they're almost not different. So on, on, on hot days, you can see that you're gaining anywhere in this area about almost two degrees total here. And, and on days like this, where it happens to be cooler, you're seeing almost no difference. So you're getting, you know, that 60, 60 degree air coming into that room. And that's R13 supply, no radiant barrier. Yeah, I apologize. That's, that's a, it should be 39 foot. Yeah, this, this is a non-radiant barrier attic, yeah. Cool. And, and mind you, we, it, it takes a long time to find where the, the unit is running constantly because remember how I said that I argued with the installer saying, hey, look, we need a two and a half ton. He's like, no, I'm going to put a three ton. I don't trust you. Uh, well, this is what you get. You get short cycling. So finding a, a time where the system is running and, the, and it's running at a continuous cycle to where you can measure both supply and return, that's what we're looking at. And then this is just a, a much more zoomed in view over here. Right, so where you can see uh, the very minimal degree difference. Because you can see once it's constantly on, it's almost exactly the same here, and it rises up at the same rate, right? So once the system turns off, it actually increases at the same rate. Because the whole thing is under the same amount of insulation. Yeah. Um, so this, uh, these are some of the stuff that was done by uh, the Home Innovation Research Laboratory was the berry duct stuff. Uh, we talked about the dew point gradients, um, the berry ducts versus not buried, right? So technically the duct that you're looking at would be considered a not buried duct because there's no insulation above the, the main cord. Uh, this is uh, just talking about the Lady, uh, the, the Lady Smith Island uh, experiment. This is the cost. Uh, I'll talk about it real quick. Um, so one of the things that we found out was, you know, what cost to the builder is the concern for this? And what we realized that there's not much to it, even in our field testing that we're doing now with the homeowners, uh, the home builders that are being, you know, showing us their data, we're, we're noticing that there's not much of an increase to what they're doing because hanging a duct and laying a duct is, it costs them no extra money. Um, the only added cost is just the amount that, uh, that you know, whatever fiberglass in, or insulation or cellulose insulation you choose to put up on top of it would amount to. And what we're seeing is, you know, depending on the, the, the joist size, right? Cause you know, if we're doing rafters, um, 14 inch rafter, I have to insulate 14 inches underneath the duct and then the duct above it. So that adds some cost, but on, if you're doing like a truss built home where it's a two by four uh, bottom cord, it becomes, you know, about a 1.2 times expense uh, on insulation versus, you know, like an unvented closed cell, you know, foam, which would be never used in Texas uh, on the roof deck. Uh, now, are you looking at a two by four truss like that 
would your recommendation be to have three and a half inches of insulation and then run it across the top? I mean, obviously I saw in the other picture, ideally you're running it parallel to the joist and you can run it right on the drywall, but where you have to run perpendicular um, to the yes. bottom cord of the truss, you want it, you want that duct running laser straight. So you want three and a half inches of fiberglass underneath it. Is that right? Yeah, correct. Okay. Correct. That's right. And you know, it's, you know, we, we've done, we've done enough jobs to know that, you know, you, one, you have to roll with the punches. Um, you have to, you know, you have to, you can do so much on paper until you get to the field and see how they actually built it. Um, then you kind of have to, you know, adjust accordingly. Uh, the one thing I do always recommend is uh, if, if a builder does decide to do buried ducts is put ducts in first because they don't have, then they don't have to jump over uh, pipes. They don't have to jump over a bunch of electrical cords, ever, you know, uh, cables, conduit, you know, it's, it's all out the way. The ducts are where they need to be. That's what we're focusing on because that's, that's what's causing the energy efficiency. That's what's causing the comfort, right? So all these callbacks that they deal with, if they focused on just one thing, and it would just be the buried duct situation and then added things later, it's much easier. Now, one of the things that I always recommend is um, uh, test after, uh, you know, uh, mechanical and plumbing are, are I'm sorry, uh, electrical and plumbing are done uh, before you end up putting gypsum. Because if you have to fix a pipe because someone trampled it, stepped over it, I always recommend doing a, a duct blaster test then, but, it, you know, most, of, most home builders like to do it at the very end before the homeowner moves in. All right, so as far as ERI, based on the 15.4, uh, because you get the ducts in condition space and because you get the R value, uh, you can see that there's a, there's a huge decrease versus a standard home uh, duct layout versus the buried duct. And, and then on top of that versus that deeply, that, that truly ducts in condition space, right? So there is a gradient and I understand that, you know, now we're on version 16 something and some, uh, some people just use that, um, uh, the state standard code here. So install installation, right? Um, we have, so Owens Corning ourselves has set up a set of guidelines uh, based on our experience. Um, at the moment, I don't know of any other manufacturer that has done this. Um, so if you end up looking for buried ducts, you're going to find us, but we are trying to work with other, other installation manufacturers because we feel that it's a wonderful solution to home efficiency for the future. Um, so, you know, we have to look at the ceiling R value, the standard duct design, and, and the, the, 25, the R25 credit for condition criteria, right? So we have to talk to the framer in case there's anything that needs to be done. And then the HVAC has to be installed and sealed, and then insulator has to properly cover it, right? And, and for HVAC, once again, we're just bringing it down and, um, Every, so I'll be honest with you, all the HVAC contractors that I've worked with have liked this system because it does actually two things for them. One, it actually, it's, a lot, it's less labor than hang it because they don't have to go up there in the attic and start strapping things up. And then two, they typically have to sell a much more efficient unit because of it, because they have to go down in the tonnage. Um, so in my experience, most, most uh, HVAC contractors end up selling a two-stage uh, and sometimes even an, an inverter. And I, I will always recommend an inverter system for this, for this because of the way it works. Um, right, so we have to consider a couple of things with ducts. Uh, this is one of the items that is, is crucial, right? So how we lay our ducts and, and, um, and calling them compact. Um, let me just load it all up. So once again, uh, putting something on paper is not the same as, as a, uh, doing something in real life, right? You have the situations where you have those taller joists or, uh, you know, any, any sort of like blue lamp beam that it has to go over. Um, but what, you know, the other part is that we want to get it as, you know, under and as close to the gypsum as fast as possible. And if not, then we just have to find a solution to where we can bring insulation over it. Um, the other thing that we want to do is we also want to shorten things. Um, and you'll see that here, right? So we want we want we want a compact design uh, where we use our uh, ventilation duct boots to throw air rather than coming all the way to the edge. And and the reason why we do this is because in Texas, one of the I mean, in Texas one of the wonderful things that we do is we do 
vaulted ceilings at almost all edges. It's, it's, oh, it feels like it's almost standard. And so you will not be able to get enough insulation over a duct if it's at the edge. If you were doing an energy truss, the duct at the end doesn't matter because it can be continuously buried all the way to the end, right? So that's one of the things that we do have to consider is we have to pull all these ducts in to make sure that we're going to be able to get uh, a proper coverage on the ducts. Um, uh, plenums and uh, so we, we use uh, side mount uh, plenum trunks and boot connections uh, to help maintain. So we, what, we do, what we don't like is we don't like a top mounted because what happens is, is that duct has to climb up and then come down and that affects the airflow, air pressure, especially in a, in a static control system. All right, so 90 degree boots is, is one of the most uh, beneficial. Um, the other thing that we did know, note in, in our studies that in Texas, uh, if you're gonna do anything, you don't want interior in, uh, insulated boots. You want exterior insulated boots. And the reason why I say that is because uh, fiberglass is air permeable, air at high rate pushes through that unless there's some sort of coating or some sort of a barrier and causes the outside of that metal to be cold and metal is a, is a, as a condensation point. So one of the things we also look at is covering up all the connections. So everything has to be covered on the external side. It may have an internal R value, but the outside matters more. Uh, so here's a run. Uh, what we, you know, here's a run where we have a, a flex truck trunk. We have a T going off of it on a vaulted ceiling. And it, you, as you can see, we'll have plenty of room to have the whole R value go over the trunk itself. Uh, short run to a boot over a, a, uh, over a big um, engineered member there. And uh, you can see that it's externally insulated. All right, here's, here's another view in the same home. This is the, the one in Clifton. 100% um, covered on the exterior. While, as you can see inside, it has insulation, but it's just, it's not enough for buried ducts. In fact, that actually, that's actually our Achilles heel is the boots because the metal will pass, will has a much better chance of causing condensation. Uh, Corpus Christi, hint, hint. Um, so our value is based on the region. You know, we, we talked about it. We're, we're, you know, here we're talking about our R13 duct because it's what they tested. Um, like I said, we're testing an R8 duct solution and we, uh, based on our modeling and some of the field data that we have, we actually know that an R8 duct will perform equally as well. Um, so you probably guys, you know, it won't be until the next code cycle. It probably, it probably won't be out to 2024 when we actually go debate it. Um, but that is one thing that we're, we have realized and that we're gonna be working on with um, a hurl, with NREL, and with uh, local municipalities if possible. But otherwise, you, you know, builders currently have to create an R8 within an R, you know, inside an R6 or vice versa to get that R14 to consider an R13 duct in our climate zones right now. Were you at um, the code hearings? How did R13 even make it into the code when it doesn't? I mean, I figured that's one sneaky manufacturer that the only one that makes an R13 flex. No, no, no one, no one makes an R13. It was what was tested. Like I said, um, they tested an R6 with an inch of, with, with an inch of closed cell spray foam on it, and it worked well. Uh, and that's how we got the R, the, that number R13. Gotcha. Um, that's, that's, that's that's it. There, not a single manufacturer makes an R13 to this day. That's unfortunate. Not even us. Like we don't make it. You know, there's not, you know, we, we'd have to have a, 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 uh, a reason to make it. Yes, code is enough, but if there's not a, you know, if the marketplace isn't going, hey, uh, excuse, you know, we need an R13, please make one, you know, people don't, people don't make it. So we have to manually make it currently. Um, so this is an example of what it would look like and the reason why we can't, you know, why we want a compact system, right? So you can imagine if that duct was further out, it's against the hot roof deck and it's literally uh, equating our R value to zero, right? So it's far back enough to where you're gonna get that nice mound. Uh, there's a ruler system you can see there in that pink flag. It's basically construction tape and then they tape it or on the bottom, slap it on top and then staple a, um, 
a ruler on it so that way you can actually see how much r value is going to be over that duck and uh you can you then you can obviously see where that is um we talked about this already right uh, decreasing uh boot connections should be sealed you know as always and that's you know one thing i always tell builders is you know when you give the painters the option to cock uh the the register what they do is they cock it to the ceiling but what what they were paying for was cocking this little joint here that that hole is is crucial to making sure that we keep air you know our uh, air tight layer um right so one of the things that we want to do is keep ducks flat in the attic uh use side mount taps uh everywhere uh minimize duck size you know duck lengths um and and reduce the option of crossing over and uh seal all connections and insulate the boots properly so insulating sorry, i'm looking at my watch making sure so once again here's another picture of a, a depth you know a cow um, a ruler or an attic ruler with a, a simple system you know there's no patent on it if there's it's simple it's easy people can people can read it and see it and as you can see you know this trunk is crossing a bunch of um truss cords but as soon as that intersection comes where that that uh register is going to come off of it, it it's going down immediately onto the the um, the gypsum so that's that's crucial when when talking about it and of course baffles to prevent airflow from moving them uh on on attic roof systems we we, we ask dams so in this situation on this plenum what we would do is build a dam because the plenum also has to be buried under insulation um so we they would have to have a creative way of stopping that insulation from just toppling over but allow enough area to where someone can work in that area and then so you can see here where the buried duct is right it's right there against that that in that truss cord with that mount right so bearing ducks the correct at the depth right so this is like you know let's i don't know what r value it is but let's let's just all say it's an r38 right so if this is an r38 that means that that has to be whatever the difference of that uh duct is minus that r value of the duct over here and then so on this we want to make sure we have depth gauges as you can see in this previous picture we did not we don't have any depth gauges um but you can tell where the, the trunk is um extra baffles that are needed uh, no radiant barrier uh, uh currently that's kind of what we're sticking to we will be testing radiant barriers uh this year hopefully if not next year and seeing how much they actually affect um possible condensation on ducts both r13 and um R8 ducts and insulation dams around the units. And once again, the most vital, it's last, but it's not least, it's right sizing the unit. If you oversize the tonnage, you're going to cause short cycling, causing comfort issues, causing mold, causing a lot of issues in a home. And that's one thing that we have to avoid. So in conclusion, um, we, we get to reduce the our, uh, ERI score, improving with code compliance installing an unvented attic um, or ducts in the condition uh, with, with getting ducts in condition space um, using energy efficient measures for trade-offs and then the other thing is you know we want to we want to make you know build it tight build it right uh, both the duct and the home right and and keeping costs down but that that's it for me I, I can't believe you you mean you have HVAC contractors that would willingly oversize a unit that doesn't happen in reality. <laughs> Sarcasm. <laughs> it's unbelievable man that's I had no joke Neil probably 600 HVAC contractors in classes. Um, I mean all across the state I did them and 19 out of 20 and, and I you know I, I prefaced the question with hey I'm not turning y'all in or anything I'm just curious. Who, who you know who does residential construction they raise their hand okay of you who, who does manual j load calculations um on their jobs and it without exaggerating 85 to 90 percent do not do j s and d correctly they do rules of thumb yep yep and and that's that's the that's the only concern um so all the all the home builders that we have you know there's there's people who do it on their own and 
but all the people that we are involved with, um, inspectors are inspectors, HVAC people, and uh, insulators are the people at the table. When when we come in there, those are the people that I care about the table. I want the inspector to be able to inspect it properly and understand what he's looking at. I want the HVAC guy to give me that, right? It's not an option anymore. It's not I, not rule of thumbs. We need to do a, a manual uh, manual JDS to make sure that we're going to comply properly and you're gonna properly size it based on bearing ducts. And then on top of that, air leakage. You know, a lot of them, you know, even, even if they do do a manual JDS, most people end up sticking to that standard, you know, five to seven ACH 50 that, that's, that's set in the program rather than actually changing it to what it would be, right? Can you imagine how many, how many homes are being oversized in climate zone uh, three that are required three ACH 50 versus you know, San Antonio is required five. It's, it's, it's hard. It's, you know, it's, it's one of the things that you, you work with them and, you know, you hope to catch a lucky one sometimes. Well, and, you know, and we can certainly understand both sides because from the HVAC contractor's point of view, he, I, I, you know, you, you can still say comfortable. Now, granted, you probably have to keep the thermostat four degrees lower than you should to because the relative humidity in the house is higher um and and i i kind of understand you know because 20 years ago when windows were so crummy and we didn't blow our door test well you know then then that rule of thumb and then erring on the side of oversizing was right but i think it plays exactly into what you just said is now we know how tight the houses are you know now in addition to knowing exactly how tight the houses are and exactly how much the ducts are leaking. We've got way, way better windows. Um, I mean, that's probably the biggest thing is, oh my, the, the fenestration qualities made light leaps and bounds in the last 20 years. Um, yeah. But it's, cool. it's, it's a battle I'm constantly fighting. Do have a couple of questions. Uh, let's see. I'm not sure what that one is. So I'm gonna move on to the next one. It says effective R value. I, oh yeah, that's right. I answered this one. I think that's correct. So effective R values are the cumulative values for all materials within the assembly. For R38 code assembly uh, and climate zone one through three only, we would need the R8 plus R6 plus R24 blown over the top per building science and NREL. Are they wrong? No, that, that's, that's correct. So okay. it, 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 it actually, it, it would be the R8 and the R6 and then on top of that. Yes, that's correct. That's how, that's how we're installing it. That's, that's why, I don't know if I, I, I don't may, I may have glanced over it. I said, uh, typically it would be an R38, um, but you get to reduce because of the duct. Because you actually get to include the duct into that R38 calculation. And this is more of a statement, but I want to give you a chance to go ahead and take Armando off your Christmas card list and respond to it. Armando says, there's a huge difference when we use blown cellulose to blown fiberglass. We found the density and permeability of blown fiberglass allows for convection loops. Would you like to respond to that? Um, I, I'd like to see a study. Uh, con convection looping happens at any gap greater than three eighths of an inch. Mm -hmm. So if you have that gap in fiberglass, then yeah, you have convection looping. Um, but you, if you but have you that shouldn't. gap in cellulose, correct, you shouldn't, but if you, you have that, that same gap in cellulose, you would have convection looping. If you had that gap in spray foam, you would have convection looping. Right. So it's, it's not so much about what the material is, it's much more about the actual, um, the actual way it's installed. If it's not installed properly, yes, there could be convection looping. If it's yeah. installed properly, all materials should not have convection looping, spray foam yeah. included. Right. Well, and I've seen, you know, I've rented, um, I, I've, I've gone and bought blown insulation just to add to an attic of, of my houses before. And the big box, you know, the Home Depot of the world, I don't, back in the day, this was the case. I don't know if it's still the case, but they would give you the, the machine to blow it with if you bought your blown from them. And I had to take a machine back one time just because it was blowing clumpy. It, it wasn't, doing a good job of creating a nice blown, no three eighths gaps, real, not, you know, good consistent density. Uh, yeah, of the, of, I, of the, so I've, I'm, I've dealt, I've, I think I've dealt with the same machine before. And what I've had to do is basically 
bring the hose back down and blow it all back into the actual like uh, bucket, you know, in, into the where, where you put the insulation. And after the second time, it actually worked better. But yes, you know, if, if the baffles are are messed, um, you know, baffles or paddles are messed up. If if there's a seal that's broken in a blowing machine, it's not gonna it's not gonna be installed properly. Yeah, well, that, that was those, great. I, I I hope you know keep up the good work, Neil, because we, we've got to do something to, you know, like like I think you, what you said was very true. Is once you allow the builders to start doing it, they're gonna fight tooth and nail to get it back. And with real estate being what it is, especially I mean, you go to the Austins and the parts of Dallas and Houston, it's prime real estate and you're not, you're just simply not going to use X amount, lose X amount of square footage for your air handler in the inside. And then you're not going to fur down the hallways and do, do the things that you could do to truly get them in conditioned space. But this is a meet me in the middle kind of approach that I, that I think should really work pretty well. Yeah. And, and, and we, we found that um, for the builders who, who want to do uh, better but aren't comfortable going like jumping right to spray foam. This is a typically intermediate step for them, and and you know, it cost cost wise, it's not much more different than what they're doing already. And but they get the the benefit of if they pull a unit in, they get that uh, ducts and condition space uh, credit, which allows them to compete with uh, people who are doing like spray foam and stuff like that. Yeah, there's there's benefits of it. Well, um... Yeah, that's that the the foam people. I mean, being able that R thirteen, it seems like that's just kind of making you shoot a little foam around your R. Uh, I wish they would have not tested that assembly quite like that. Chris asked, he's like, well, that seems kind of like it's pushing to make spray foam mandatory almost, but it's no, it, it's 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 definitely not. It's just it's giving you guys more option, right? Uh, right. One thing for the people who weren't here earlier, we were talking about diffusion ports. Mm -hmm. And uh, uh, so we have we have house, houses currently that we're testing with diffusion ports in Texas. And the reason why a majority of my stuff is in Texas is because one, I'm here. And two, we have an extreme climate. You know, Texas has technically, I think, five climate zones. Four. Right? Uh, wait, two, three, and four. Three climate zones, no, but, but it's but, but we also have eight, a and B. Yeah, five. Five. We have, we have uh, five climate zones. Yeah. And... Um, you know, California is the only other location that has that amount of climate zones. You know, they have 16, but that's state local. Um, but yeah, you know, we want to make sure it works because if it works in Texas, it could pretty much work anywhere. Well, and we're building way more homes than anybody else too. So you have a whole lot more option down here. Yep. All right. So I'll go ahead and stop it right there. There was a lot of good information that he had uh, that brought into that. Sorry again for the technical difficulties on jumping on the screen. Uh, replaying these aren't easy when you're trying to answer the Q&A or the chat questions. Um, but th this presentation just I brought this back up because it, it, it's going to become more of a um, I believe it will become more of a uh, something that you see as opposed to not seeing um, just because the 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 changes in the code is going to start making it uh, advantageous for them to start doing that to try to get um, the, the cold air that's being created by the, the unit is actually getting to the, the, the rooms itself. So it's good to see that, that Neil and his company, Owens Corning, has gone through the testing and the uh, looking at different levels and what worked and what didn't work. Um, he's correct, though, you know, R13 ducks are not currently being um, constructed by any manufacturer still, even today, even this was three years old. Uh, I don't know of anybody that makes that. So that's not really an option. So trying to bury those, and, and there's an increase in trust systems being used now in high volume production homes. So it would be easier to do than what it would be in the past with a stick fill, stick built frame, um, like built on site. But now that they're doing trusses, uh, it's basically you know you've already you've already got the runs. You know where the 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 purlings are going to be. You know where the supports are going to be. It's easier to do it that way. So this was an information video that I, I've watched a couple of times over, learned something new every time I watch it. I thought I'd bring that up and actually roll uh, roll this again and go through it. I've tried to reach out to Neil. I haven't heard a response back unless there's an update for that. But if we start seeing this, you know, it, it may become more commonplace. So 
Uh, thanks again for joining today. Uh, sorry for the interruptions with Jason. He's the one that originally uh, hosted that webinar, but he brought up some good information and some good questions for information to be discussed by discussed by Neil. So he answered a lot of stuff that was on there. So again, you may not be able to, you may not be seeing this, but as more cities adopt 2021, you may start seeing more of that in permit requests. And then, of course, without saying increased energy costs could also push this to be more commonplace. So as uh, electricity um, and gas starts going up in pricing, you may see more of that uh, coming into more commonplace. There's more builders that look to do things differently um, that's going to decrease the energy use or energy consumption of the home as well. So thanks again for joining us today. Just some uh, upcoming webinars that we've got going. March 2nd, which is this Thursday at 11 a.m., we've got Energy Star on the Rise. That's me kind of giving a, a, a spiel on why you see a, an increase in popularity for the Energy Star program now being used more in high volume builders. Uh, we walk through a little bit of that. And then March 7th at 11, we've got some, my first attempt at trying to do an energy code walkthrough. It's going to be some previously recorded videos that I've looped into one long video to openly discuss kind of what we see and how an energy inspector um, is runs his day and does his, his uh, inspections and what he finds in the field. And then March 9th, we got um, at 11 a.m. as well, another rerun. It's 2021 IECC commercial code lighting requirements. Uh, I'm getting more questions fielded to me with this. Uh, so I just thought I'd rerun that. So as more cities adopt 2021, there's big questions on just lighting requirements for code for commercial. And then on the 16th, uh, another new one for me, just to try to something different is, are we speaking the same language when it comes to energy inspections? This is kind of almost an open Q&A um, for me to the to the um, to the audience. We kind of I'll have some presentation pictures. We'll go through it. We'll talk about it. We'll discuss uh, and we'll see if we can get some language and, and some commonality co conversations happen with that part of it. And then also on March 28th, uh, we've got HVAC uh, ventilation. So it's an update from a previously recorded webinar that was done by Tom Merle with QFresh. So he's going to do an update on the importance of the V in HVAC. So at this time, if anybody's got any questions, please feel free to uh, post it in the Q&A section. I'll wait a few minutes before I um, come out of this. The next webinar, the next uh, thing we have here is just my contact information. A few of you guys reached out and asked on the chat about are the, are the PA, PDFs available. Unfortunately, I don't have access to his presentation but I can do my best in trying to find them. So if you need it uh, to show your staff, please email me using this email below, uh, and I'll try to get that to you uh, as quick as I can. I don't, again, don't have access to his presentation. But as I said in the beginning of this, it, this presentation that's previously recorded is on our YouTube channel. It's closer to the bottom where it's down in 2020, so it's part of the first a uh, few webinars that we did for that on that channel that's being up, that's been uploaded. So I'll have to look for it, but it just says Barry Ducks for 2018 is the title for that part of it. So this one was being recorded today, but I, I don't think I'll repost it. Um, it's it's going to be the first originally aired post, so it's still going to be further down in the history of that. So if there's any, not any more questions, we'll end it here, guys. Thanks again, and we'll we'll talk to you guys on Thursday. Appreciate it.